Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I'm back with another question, the narrative video, and today's topic is Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Seven Sages of Myth and Legend. You know, I'm just going to warn you ahead of time that this video is just going to be a series of rabbit trails because that is how I actually conceived of this idea. The original idea for today's video was just going to be on the giantess of Malta and the giants who built the Cholula Pyramid in Mexico. And I actually got those ideas from watching Ancient Apocalypse on Netflix with Graham Hancock. And I'm going to get back to him a little bit later. But as I was watching these shows on Malta and Cholula, some puzzle pieces started fitting together, or maybe just some neurons started firing in my brain. I don't know. And so what was going to be a basic video about those two things has now morphed into what it's going to end up being. Okay, so I'm going to start out with the original place that I, that I was going to, um, because the, the island of Malta probably has the least to do with the rest of the rabbit trails that we're going to be on today, but it still has enough to do with it that I'm still going to mention it in today's video because you know a lot of us have been speculating on the pyramids and a lot of people believe that it was giants who built the pyramids including the pyramids of ancient Egypt. So ancient Egypt isn't the only place that we hear this but for some reason I've noticed that the pyramids of ancient Egypt get the most the most press. They are the pyramids that most people know about even though there are pyramids worldwide. But even so, yeah, there's there's always been a lot of speculation as to how did this ever get built with the size of the, the blocks and just the manpower that they had at the time and the tools that they supposedly had at the time. So yes, yeah, so some speculation has been that giants built not only pyramids, but megalithic structures in general. Now, I do have to say that um, a friend of mine reminded me that there also are, I believe it was, um, I don't know if it's in ancient Egyptian records or in hieroglyphics where it actually looks like they are levitating these stones. And you know, the fact is, is that we don't know what the actual technology was of these people. Um, a lot of the history that we're taught is twisted because they want us to think that we are at peak level for humanity when in fact entropy has been in play all this time and we've just been getting worse and worse. But the fact remains, even if, if it that was the method they would have used in Egypt, other megalithic structures, it's definitely, you know, it's a question, especially with the fact that there are stories of giants worldwide. And I've done many videos on them. This is just going to be one more. So let's just take a look at Malta, the island of giants, and one story in particular. We're going to put to take a look at um a megalithic structure called Gigantia. Once upon a time, Sansuna, a giantess on the island of Gozo, went to the town of Tasenk, placed huge stones upon one of her shoulders, and carried them four kilometers to their current resting place at Gigantia, the place of giants. A multitasker, she did this while holding her half-giant, half-human baby over the other shoulder. Now, I'm just going to interject here that on the show that Graham Hancock did on this, he said that the Gigantia complex was actually built to commemorate the birth of her child. Anyway, so taking these heavy stones, she then built the temple complex of Gigantia and afterwards allowed the local people to worship within. Um, and then it says more unusually and perhaps irrelevant to the story, but hey, it's often little details that make a tale believable. She lived exclusively on broad beans and honey, though some versions replace the honey with water. As old legends go, it's an entertaining one, but it's not the only explanation for Gigantia's megalithic prehistoric temple complex. I had also read that it had served as a, de as a defensive tower, again built by a race of giants. So now what really interested me about this story, first of all, was just the fact that here we have an actual legend. And um, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm thinking of Cholula now. But it, it's, it's the same um, scenario. 
a lot of times we're just speculating about what built these megalithic structures and the idea of giants very often just comes from our own imagination. So it's, you know, it's really interesting when you see these stories are actually coming up in the legends of the people who built these structures or who were at least alive when these structures were built. So this is just one of them. Let's just take a look at the Gigantia temples. And so you can just imagine the feat of moving stones that how many tons must these weigh? There's another one, just zoom in on that a bit. So, you know, you can almost imagine her carrying it on her shoulder with the baby also on her other shoulder, maybe, and just bringing these up the hill. And, you know, it's, it's the same question as with Egypt, you know, how would they have gotten these gigantic stones and a lot of times even just set them on top of each other, as we see here. This reminds me very much of Stonehenge, although I think it's a little bit more symmetrical, although I'm just going to say right now that a lot of these ancient historical sites have been redone. So we actually know for a fact that Stonehenge has been redone because there was a video of where someone showed the inside of it and it looked like there was some sort of um, like like a beam to reinforce it because it obviously had been redone. And the same thing has happened with the pyramids in Mexico, with the pyramids in Egypt. When they found these pyramids, they didn't look like what we see today. They have been redone. So we really do need to remember that. We'll just look at one more. And here we go. This is just from the top. And so the largest building of Gigantia is known as the cathedral. Entering the Gigantia archaeological site in Gozo, Malta's sister island, I could immediately see why such legends had evolved. Approaching the temple from the rear along a modern walkway, the path is alive with brightly colored flowers, an enormous wall of gray interlocking monoliths, some weighing at least 20 tons. So, yeah, definitely more than I even thought rose into view. Um, let's just skip down here. A little bit it says scholars discounting the possibility of a giant enhanced workforce have estimated that 50 men were needed to erect a single one of these exterior megaliths and that the entire temple took around 30,372 days to construct to add to its complexity though appearing to mark a single building this great wall is actually a d-shaped enclosure that encompasses two separate temples to the north and south so if you take away the idea, which is the legend that the people um, believe that this was built by giants, it would take 50 men just to erect one exterior megalith. One. One. So anyway, very interesting. Now let's move on to Cholula. Okay, so this was also, this was a separate show on Ancient Apocalypse, and this this particular show was the one that actually got the rabbit trail started, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but let's just read a little bit of this article here. If I say anything wrong, I, I, I'm trying, so anyway, Jalua, the giant who built the world's largest pyramid in Cholula, Mexico. Jalua, a giant from the times of the Universal Flood, according to Aztec culture, was allegedly responsible for building the largest pyramid on the face of the earth. So yes, this, this pyramid here is actually larger than the pyramid at Giza. Now what I want to point out to you is that what you're seeing here is actually the entrance to tunnels that go underneath this giant pyramid. If you actually look at the pyramid from a distance, it does not look like a pyramid anymore. There's grass all over it. And um, I think the Spanish con conquistadors actually built a church on top of it. But there are still these entrances and there's lots of tunnels and everything underneath. And I also want to point out that this is very likely also redone. They very likely did not find it like this. Um, the Great Pyramid of Cholula is located seven kilometers west of 
Puebla de Zaragoza, capital of the Mexican state of Puebla. It is the largest archaeological site of a pyramid to exist in today's world. The pyramid is so large that it can go unnoticed, especially due to the fact that it is buried under centuries of vegetation that grew on it. When Cortes and his men arrived in Cholula in October 1519, some 1,800 years after the pyramid was constructed, they massacred around 3,000 people in a single hour that is, that is the 10% of the entire city's population and leveled many of their religious structures. And we will just continue going down, but... Here, actually, no, I'm going to read this. The Spanish conquerors settled in the said area and erected their colonial buildings and churches everywhere. However, when it came to Cholula, the Spanish conquerors failed to realize that there was a temple. The Spanish conquerors thought that it was just a hill and on the top of which they decided to build a church dedicated to the uh, Virgen de los Remedios. I don't know how to say that. The confusion of the Europeans saved the pyramid from destruction. One thing I want to point out that I believe Hancock said in the show was that he doesn't think that they didn't realize that it was a temple. He's fairly certain that they knew it was a temple because it was common practice to build things like cathedrals and churches on top of other sacred sites, of ancient sacred sites. So let's just get down to where we're going to talk about, oh, and here's the, the church that is on top of the hill right now. And so the Great Pyramid of Cholula has a base that is four times larger and nearly twice the volume than the Great Pyramid of Giza. Anyway, let's, let's read about how it was built. As with the pyramids of Giza and Egypt, there are also no records that describe when and how the Great Pyramid of Cholula was erected. Archaeologists and re researchers have only managed to sketch estimates so far, placing its construction around 300 BC. And I want to also point out that we know the timeline is messed up. So take all of these dates with a grain of salt. However, within the myths about the foundation of the millenary and theocratic Cholula, the architectural wonder is attributed to a giant named Zelua. I, I don't know if it's Jelua, Zelua, I don't know. Who saved, who saved himself from the universal flood. So there's that flood story coming in. The one that we know is, is not just the biblical flood story. There are, there are stories of the flood worldwide. Um, by taking, so he escaped the universal flood, it says, by taking refuge in the caves of the mountain of Tlaloc, the god of rain. I want to point out, Tlaloc is the god of rain of Atlantis. They, they left that out. Anyway. Then Zalua directed his steps towards the Cholula Valley, Cholula Valley, where he ordered the men to raise a pyramid in commemoration. So here's the really interesting part. So according to the writings of Dominican monks who visited the place in 1566, the legend says the following. At the time of the flood, the giants lived on the earth. Many perished, submerged in the waters. Some were turned into fish, and only seven brothers were saved in the caves of the Tlaloc Mountain. And I want you to remember this. Seven brothers. Zalua, the giant, went to the site that was later called Tloyan, and with large adobes made in Talmanalaco, a very distant site, and ordered men to build the pyramid in memory of the mountain where he was saved. So this story here is telling us that a giant built it. And not only that, seven brothers, he was one of the seven brothers, was saved in the caves of the mountain and that this pyramid was built um, afterwards. And this actually here makes a connection with Atlantis right here though, because it's often believed that, and as we're gonna get into this, that there's a commonality all over the world. Now, first of all, we know that there are worldwide stories of giants, worldwide stories of, of, of a flood, of a, a worldwide flood, of there are pyramids all over the earth. Um, we see a lot of the same architecture, Mega megalithic structures all over the earth, um, the same types of creatures all over the earth that don't exist today and that we're told never existed. Then we have stories of the, Nephil of the Nephilim or demigods that are also all over the world. And here is another thread now that we can add to this is these seven giants because they very, very nicely 
tie in with the worldwide stories of seven sages. Sometimes it is seven fallen angels. Um, and so my question is really just going to be, let's explore this. And could they have been talking about the same seven beings? Now, one thing that I want to point out, when Graham Hancock speaks about these legends of giants, let me just say that he is so, so close. He is so close to like uncovering the truth um, because he, he sees things that many archaeologists refuse to a lot of times just because they have been indoctrinated so much that they don't recognize it for what they see. A lot of them just don't want to lose funding. They don't want to be blacklisted. And he's not afraid to look at these things, most likely because he is more of like a, a research journalist. But when it comes to the giants, he, he can't see that far. He still believes that they use the word giant just to mean like a highly intelligent individual or a, a highly advanced culture. And, you know, it is my thought that these people were not as dumb as, as a lot of people think they were. And I'm pretty sure that they would have had, you know, some word for intelligent. It's, you know, it's just, it's too much of a coincidence that all these cultures all over the world kept, you know, using the word giant. I mean, in fact, the, the cathedral on, uh, was, yeah, on Malta, is called Gigant what is it called? Gigantia. So yeah, and that in itself is gigantic, but it also commemorates who built it. So I really hope that he like gets, I don't know, an, an inspiration is like, oh hey, wait a minute. Maybe, maybe they're being a little bit more literal than I'm giving them credit for. So let's hope, because I enjoy his work and I'm hoping that at one point he'll he'll put those pieces together. So now this is where the rabbit trail really begins. Um, I have also been reading this book right here, The Genesis 6 Con Conspiracy by Gary Wayne, and I will leave a link in the description box for it. Um, and this is the book that really helped me to start connecting the dots when I was watching these shows on Ancient Apocalypse. Um, because as soon as I heard seven giants that, you know, survived the, the flood, I immediately started thinking about what I had just read. Like literally it was like the chapter that I had read the day before. And that was about also seven, uh, sages, seven Kings, seven, um, semi-divine beings, but all of them that also survived the flood. So, and again, here we have this going worldwide. So I'm just going to read to you a little bit. So first we have the seven sages of Atlantis. Now for a sage is an extremely wise person. Um, there are, I believe it was in India, the sage kings were considered the sons of gods. So that's what we're talking about when we say sage. So the seven sages of Atlantis. During the first time, another curious group in Egypt was founded. Their legacy continued even after the deluge. This fascinating group was identified as the followers of Horus, the seven fallen angels, the Shebtu, the Sebeti, the seven sages who provided illicit heavenly knowledge, who were mythological beings remembered both as the bearers and the preservers of knowledge. They founded a cult of astronomer priests that guarded the Atlantean knowledge, religion, and technology for millennia after the deluge. And that cult spawned brotherhood, brotherhood orders of the snake that continue even to this day. So think about these secret societies. Freemasons. Um, what are they called? The Eastern Star? Another, another one? They all have their roots in this order. So just remember that. Um, let's see. These curious antediluvian gods, the Sebeti, Shebtu, not coincidentally were recorded and described as beings with the characteristic long-headed serpentine distinction. And I did talk about this in one of my other videos. Um, they were known also as Urshu or Watchers. They were divine beings that acted as intermediaries between humans and the high-ranking gods. Their illustrious snake order of priests appears to be akin to the semi-divine order of Enoch and Oannes. Now, does Oannes look familiar to you? 
you remember when we spoke about Dagon, who was the God that was, that is, um, who he is the God that was worshiped by the people of Nineveh. And it is the same one from the same one that we call Oannes. So let's take a look at that. See if I can jog your memory. Does this ring a bell? So this is what I just talked about in one of my most recent videos. I don't remember if it was my last one or not. I'm like, my days are getting mixed up. But yes, this is Oannes, otherwise known as Dagon. Now, when we talk about the order of Enoch, well, let, let's continue and I'll get back to this in a minute. So the illustrious snake order of priests appears to be akin to the semi-divine order of Enoch, Oannes, who led the Anunnaki down from Mount Hermon. The designation Urshu actually translates from ancient Egypt as watcher, divine beings compar comparable to the Shemsu Hor, also known as the companions of Horus. So it says that they were that that the uh, the fallen angels, the watchers, were led down Mount Hermon, and it says by Enoch or Oannes. Now, when it says Enoch, you have to be careful because it is not referring to the Enoch who was taken up by by God. That is not the Enoch that we are referring to. That Enoch was the Enoch who was in the line of Seth. In the line of Cain, there was also, he had um, a son named Enoch. And if you remember when Cain built a city, he named it after his son Enoch. That is the Enoch that we are referring to here. Not the Enoch from the line of Seth who was taken up to be with God. And actually Gary Wayne in this book often refers to this Enoch as Enoch the evil because that is the one that we are usually referring to when we are speaking about this because he had so much to do with the roots of Freemasonry and everything that is along those lines today, not the Enoch from the line of Seth. So I'm going to read to you a little bit from um, the book that I was just showing you, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy. And he said, um, Descendants of the inexplicable Shebtu are believed in the dynastic theory to have spawned the original pharaohs. The Shebtu, in my opinion, are the same divine seven sages of ancient Babylon, the Sebedi, whose patron was Enki, Satan, and who, like the Shebtu, taught humankind the illicit knowledge from heaven, which is what we are told the fallen angels did when they came down from Mount Hermon. The Sheb two consisted of eight divine beings, seven fallen angels, so that's where we get that seven from, and Satan, including Kem Kema Sata, the serpent creator of the earth. So we have right there a tie in with both Egypt and with ancient Babylon. And yes, they both have seven sages. Next we have the seven leaders of the fallen angels who descended from Mount Hermon. And this is also from his book. All sources from antiquity seem to speak to the same source for antediluvian civilization, which derived from the illicit knowledge of heaven and the seven sacred sciences received from the infamous seven fallen angels, Azazel and Shemyaza, who is thought to be the same, the same one, Amasis, Gadriel, Barakiel, Kokoriel, Tamiel, and Azdriel for the benefit of giants and rebellious humans. So um, now what he talks about in this book is that these uh, these seven fallen angels, they actually began the spurious sciences that are taught in upper level Freemasonry. Okay, now heading back to Egypt, I'm just, here's another excerpt. This book has so much information. Um, I highly recommend that you get it. It will take you a while to go through it because I've been reading it for quite a while and I have to keep reading it and rereading it and rereading it because there's so much in here that sometimes I really, like it takes a while for it to connect for me. So it, it has well over 500 pages. Um, and actually, yeah, I'm looking at it now. It's definitely more than that. There's a lot in the appendix, but okay, I'd say, yeah, it's almost 700 actually. And it's not one of those books that you can just breeze through. It, it's going to take you a while, but that's the best way to read it to make sure that you understand it. But here's something else having to do with the seven sages of Egypt. So, so far, let's, let's recap. We've got the seven giants of Cholula. 
we have the seven sages of Atlantis. We have the seven sages of Egypt. We have the seven sages of ancient Babylon. And we also have the seven leaders of the watchers that descended Mount Hermon. So anyway, Egyptian mythology holds that the surviving post-Diluvian companions of Horus salvaged and transported with them from the first time great knowledge from across the sea to Egypt, India, and China. And, you know, that's also what um, Quetzalcoatl and the Aztec um, legends, he was also said to bring information by the sea to them too. So again, we've got the same story tying in, not only now with the seven sages, but with someone coming from the sea and bringing great knowledge to these civilizations. Um, this mysterious order of sages survived the great flood. So here we go. They also, just like those seven giants, survived the great flood and arrived from a distant island or continent. They were known precariously as builder gods builder gods um senior ones and the followers of horus um let me see the seven post-diluvian sages were credited with rebuilding the post-diluvian world and recreating a new age of the gods so the seven post-diluvian sages supposedly rebuilt everything after the flood and what did we learn about in cholula that those giants built that pyramid after the flood and they restarted civilization again um the seven sages are also attributed with designing and building the egyptian monuments so there's that also i also came across this article this post about the mystery of the seven sages and ancient myths and legends and i have to point out that like it, it's a good collection of them but it doesn't come even close to listing all of them but let's just take a look at some of them that it talks about um the apkalu the demigods who were the seven sages so here we go again seven sages in babylonian myths and legends they are referred to as apkalu these beings are described as demigods created by the god anki their duty was to establish a culture and give civilization to mankind they served as priests of enki and as advisors or sages to the earliest kings of sumer before the flood the apkalu were fish-like men who emerged from the water abzu the primeval sea below the void space of the underworld and the earth so kind of makes me think of the the, the deep what the bible refers to as the the deep um, the Apkalus are referred to in several Sumerian myths in cuneiform literature. Um, and here it talks about were the seven unknown men, the seven sages in India, but here it talks about nine unknown men. So I actually have more to say about India later. So we'll, we're going to skip that one since it says nine there. I could be, you know, jumping the gun. But anyway, seven sages of ancient Greece. Um, Let's see. The first European to refer to a similar and yet less mythological tradition is the Athenian philosopher Plato, who mentioned seven names of wise people that were lovers and emulators and disciples of the culture of the Spartans. Um, so we have seven sages of ancient Greece also. Seven sages of the bamboo grove in China. The seven sages of the bamboo grove were a group of Chinese scholars, writers, and musicians of the third century. Although the various individuals all existed, their interconnection is not entirely certain. So seven sages of the bamboo grove in China. I think that's, yeah, that's the last one that's listed. There are more than that though. So we are definitely going to get into some of them that are not listed there. So we talked just a couple minutes ago about Enoch, who was also known, interestingly, as Oannes, that that fish god. So I don't, I, I'm not quite sure how that connection is there. Um, there's so much in this book, but anyway, I just want to read to you another passage here from this book. Enoch, remember Enoch the evil we are talking about, as you will recall, was the founder of the mortal order of the Nephilim seven sages. The Atlantean Companions of Horus, spoken of by Barosis and a high priest of Enki, the god of the sea. 
The leader of the Brotherhood of Fish Gods, according to Kramer, was Oannes. This was likely the angelic Oannes with whom Enoch also became directly associated as the high priest. Oh, it's telling us how they're connected here. As the high priest of this fish bull snake cult of Poseidon. It was this Enoch, Oannes, who brought the giants Nephilim Anunnaki down from the mountain, Mount Hermon, to intermix with the day six lead Cainites. And it was this Enoch, Oannes, who originally established the antediluvian kingship in partnership with the dark angels. Each of these, of these Nephilim kings was originally paired with one of the seven seraphim sages. So we also have seven seraphim sages one of the fish gods, and perhaps later with one of the earthly sages led by Enoch, one of the fish gods. Remember, again, Oannes is known as the fish god. So were there more? Apparently, that's what it sounds like to me. So now to add to all these other sages that we have been reading, we also now have the seven seraphim sages, and we have the mor mortal order of the Nephilim seven sages. This just continues and goes on and on and on. And now you can see why so many alarm bells went off in my head as I was watching this show, because I was like, wait a minute. And, you know, I'm surprised that he didn't tie, that Hancock himself didn't tie them in with this. I mean, unless later at another point in time, he will, but it, it just really surprised me that he didn't make this connection with Cholula at least. Now here, I just remember in the article, I said to you that I would get back to you about another group of seven in India. And these are the ones that I am referring to. The Saptarishi are the seven Rishis of ancient India who are extolled in the Vedas and other Hindu literature. Now, let me just, let me see if I can click on that. Okay. Let me just read to you what Hancock has to say about this. So too are these Sumerian sages the same brotherhood of ascetic snake sages recorded in the Vedas of India. Hancock, and he's, he's also talking about Graham Hancock. He does um, refer to him pretty much in this, at least in this chapter, but several times so far that I've seen. Hancock noted that both groups of antediluvian sages somehow survived into the post-diluvian epoch. So again, he, he did make that connection that they supposedly survived the flood and brought helped to bring back civilization so now we also have it going on in india um hancock also noted that both sets of sages were directly associated with fish and sea symbolism both were commissioned to preserve the gifts of civilization for humankind both before and after the flood and both were distinctive king makers adding further to these parallels hancock noted that all were ascetic brotherhoods that taught spiritual and religious doctrines to the people as well as being royal advisors to the kings the seven sages of india egypt and sumer were the same snake brotherhood that snake brotherhood that is, again, what Freemasonry, among others, is rooted in today. And Before I go on to the last culture that I could find that had something connected to the seven sages, I just wanted to share with you what I found on the seven sages of ancient Greece. The seven sages of ancient Greece were seven wise men who lived in the archaic period. They were thinkers, rulers, and statesmen. Their wisdom was revered in the ancient world, offered practical advice, and also influenced the development of the golden age of the classical world. They were pioneers of ancient Greek philosophy and politics, which still influences us to this day. Little is known about these figures or their thought, and many appear to be semi-mythical. And, you know, that's what we really need to remember is that a lot of people just look at all of these stories from around the world and they dismiss them as myths. But well, we need to remember that um, all myth myths are built around a kernel of truth, at least, you know, a kernel of truth, sometimes way more than a kernel of truth. But you need to remember, especially if you see all of these similarities all over the world, all different cultures for people who supposedly had no contact with one another. Now, again, we have to take that with a grain of salt because if they are hiding things from us here because they don't want it to destroy their narrative, I mean, do they really want to change all those textbooks? Um, I, I'm thinking not, but we need to, even though I think that a lot of these stories might have embellishments because that's what happens, especially with oral tradition over time, is that things get added on and added on and added on. But 
again, they begin with a kernel of truth. And if you see the same theme in all of these different cultures, I think it's pretty easy to see what that kernel of truth was. So, you know, what I'm wondering is, were these seven sages of all of these different cultures, I'm wondering if they were the same being, because there's just, there, there's too many similarities to uh, just write this off, in my opinion. So the last civilization that I found that had some connections to some sort of group of people known as the seven sages, seven giants, seven fallen angels, whatever it is that you want to call them, they all basically have the same um, characteristics. So they might have different names, but they have the same characteristics and the same number, and they did the same things for all the civilizations. And you know, I could just go on and on for this. But anyway, so we have here the Olmecs. So Central American legends reflecting the seven sages date back to the Olmecs in 3000 BCE. I'm going to just say BC. Because even if you're using before the common era, what was the common era? Well, it was the era after Jesus. But anyway, they were credited with providing Central Americans with all their important cultural developments. So again, the seven sages were also credited with um, helping out the Olmecs. And the Olmecs, I believe, were connected to the Aztecs. I think I'm pretty sure that the Aztecs eventually came from the Olmecs. So maybe that there is another connection with those seven giants in Cholula. So, you know, just another question that I had. So just as with this rabbit trail, um, and actually not even just this rabbit trail, but just the whole idea of the number of seven, 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 and all of these civilizations. And Gary Wayne also pointed out that the number 10 is, well, as and this is Gary Wayne's quote, 10 kings is an antediluvian mythology constant. So this could be another rabbit trail, the 10 kings that is also a concept that is known worldwide. And I will just talk to you, <coughs> excuse me, read to you just a tiny bit from that because I don't want you to be here all night or all day, depending on when you're watching this. Okay, so Gary Wayne says, Ancient Iranian legends tell about a golden age where divine kings reigned. The Shahnameh listed 10 Pishtadian or Pisidian, possibly Poseidon kings who reigned before the flood. And I want you to remember that Poseidon is linked with Atlantis. Um, oh, and he, it even says here, kings who reigned before the flood just as they did in Atlantis. The Larsa list of Sumerian kings boasted the same number of kings. It listed Ziazudra, another name for Utnapishtim, as the last of those kings that reigned before the flood. Similarly, 10, patriarch, 10 patriarchs were listed in the Genesis chronology from Adam to Noah, as well as 10 Canite patriarchs. 10 kings is an antediluvian mythology constant. The Chaldean record of Barosis from the Sumerian kings list contained 10 antediluvian kings that all lived long lifespans, just as Noah did. And obviously not even just Noah, because it was his grandfather that lived 969 years. In the same manner, India held to nine Brahmadikas, along with Brahma, the leader, making 10. And the Chinese had 10 divine antediluvian emperors, giants, actually, so they were giant emperors. And I have to say that a lot of these kings that we've been talking about all this time in these sages were, in fact, giants. And I think that's something that I like left out, but it's it's important. Yes, they were they were said to be giants. Anyway, giants called Mount Say and or 10 immortal emperors called the sons of heaven who ruled the mundane world on behalf of the heavenly gods, just as there were 10 ancestors of Odin from Norse mythology, and 10 kings of the Arabian Adites. So again, you just have to wonder, were all of these cultures speaking of the same beings? I don't know, but it was certainly fun exploring this. 
and I hope you got something out of it. And that's all that I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one either here or over on Instagram. And if you like my work and would like to check out my Patreon page, I will leave a link in the description box for that as well. And I hope you have a great day.